All right. So a fundamental message that we want to try to convey today is that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So most of us here are engaged in the scientific enterprise in some way. That's why we go to a conference about improving scientific software. And, um, and this is really at the heart of why we think better software practices, better software engineering are important. It's a real challenge these days. We have, um, there's kind of a cycle, especially in uh, high-end modeling and simulation, where we get a better understanding of physics, and that allows us to produce uh, a better model of the physics that we implement in our um, in software, which requires more diverse and complicated solvers, which require more hardware to run, and then we get we get more hardware. And that enables us to do simulations, which we compare with experiments, maybe, and we further advance our understanding of the physics. And this is, uh, in some sense, a positive feedback loop. It's positive for science, but it also makes our life a lot more complex because the codes are getting more complex. There's a lot more moving parts that need to work together. More and more these days, we find projects that are uh, uh, project teams that are comprised of larger multidisciplinary groups, often also multi-institutional groups working together. So uh, in order to bring all the expertise that's needed to the table, but at the same time, we have to have ways for people to, all these people to work together around the software, which leads to uh, concepts like separation of concerns that we'll get into a little bit more. And uh, you know, fundamentally, to, to engage all these people productively requires uh, more than just letting everybody have at the code in an unorganized fashion. And then in addition to this, we are in an age now of uh, heterogeneous computing. And so we have um, an increasing number of different computer architectures that we're trying to get all the software to run on. And um, we have requirements, scientific requirements, and we have requirements related to the, the platforms and what the next platform going to look like and things like that that may not be known from the start. And so we have to also think about the design and the software engineering processes that will allow us to adapt to those future changes more effectively. There's lots of challenges with this. There's both technical and sociological changes on the technical side. Any part of this huge software system that we're often dealing with can be under research at any given moment. So you might be modifying the physics, you might be messing with the numerics, there might be computer science issues that you're trying to improve upon. Um, and while you're doing this, the requirements for what you're trying to implement change as your understanding of the problem grows. Um, most of us are working in a space where we're trying to do things that model the real world. We represent that by floating point numbers, which bring additional complexities to the challenges of trying to verify that these things are done properly. And so kind of the end result is that the real world is messy and this gets reflected in the software that we create to model it in various ways. And then in addition, we have to deal with this increasing architectural diversity that I mentioned. And at the same time, we have sociological challenges that we're trying to deal with. The biggest one is that we have competing priorities and incentives. So our sponsors often care more about the publications than they do about the software. And we have to make decisions as the project leaders and the people doing the work about how to balance development and maintenance with research in a way that we can satisfy the sponsors as well as keeping the software in a state to, that we can use it as a tool going forward. And of course, we have limited resources with which to do this. We have to interact with people who oftentimes have different backgrounds, different expertise, and that can be challenging. Sometimes people don't even speak the same language scientifically. Um, and I've been on projects where you, we, we've spent, you know, even a year just trying to get the terminology sorted out to make sure we were talking about, we are using the, you know, same, same uh, term to refer to the same thing. So there's lots of different things we're trying to deal with. And if you don't pay attention to these things, um, problems can arise. These are a couple of 
high consequence software related failures that you may have heard about back in the 80s. There was a um, radiation, uh, a computer controlled radiation therapy system which suffered from poor software design development and testing practices that let through flaws that allowed at least six cases of uh, substantial radiation overdoses to occur before they caught it. Um, and you can, you, you can read about this. The Therac 25 was kind of an infamous case in, in software engineering. Um, and then something like the Mars Climate or Orbiter, 1999, it was lost because um, a, uh, it was trying to do a burn to insert in orbit around Mars and that went wrong and they lost the orbiter and it turns out that it was because the interface between two pieces of software didn't follow the specifications. One, they used two different units of measure in, in the two different sides of the interface uh, and it wasn't tested enough, well enough to expose that. And so they lost this you know, billion dollar uh, spacecraft because of it. Um, and really the tragic thing about the Mars Climate Orbiter is that people had recognized this and they were trying to raise concerns about it, but they didn't follow the proper procedure and those reports got ignored. So um, sometimes the impacts are a little more subtle though. This is um, a story from the Flash Astrophysics team. It's one of our colleagues who works on us with the, on the tutorial team. Back in 2005, the flash team had access to um, a special access to uh, BGL, one of the largest machines at, in the world at that time for dedicated to run. So they had less than a month to prepare for this one and a half week access period that they had. So they did some quick and de dirty development in the code of a particle tracking capability. Uh, and because it was kind of quick and hurried, they introduced an error and it took them six months after the run. They got the run through, but it took them six months afterwards to develop and apply the post-processing tools to back out the problems that that error introduced. And so the lesson here is that Flash had a software process in place. It was tested regularly. They worked very hard at the design and the software engineering processes. And because of other factors, this was a case where they couldn't apply the full rigor of their process and they suffered as a result of it. And in this case, they managed to get the science out, but it was much delayed compared to what they had originally hoped and planned. And this leads us to the concept of technical debt. How many folks have heard of, the, uh, of technical debt? Okay, good, a lot of, a lot of folks. So, this is the implied cost of rework due to choosing an easier or a more limited solution rather than implementing a better approach from the start. And it's like monetary debt, the more technical debt you accumulate, the harder it is to pay off. And it can manifest in a lot of different ways, it increases the soft cost of maintenance, parts of the software may become unusable, parts of the software may become hard or impossible to verify and um, result in, in questionable results, may take more time to on-ramp new developers, and ultimately, in various ways, it reduces your overall software productivity and therefore your overall scientific productivity. So this is um, something that we strive to, it's now talked a lot about in the software engineering community at large, and this is something to be aware of when you're making decisions about your um, process through your software development and the practices that you choose to apply in your project. Another reason why we think um, attention to the um, software engineering is important is because a lot of us are using valuable scientific resources. Um, if you're on a using a major supercomputer today, these things are typically a hundred million dollars and they cost millions of more uh, per year to operate. And so if you get a significant allocation of computer time, it can be worth literally millions of dollars. You may not have to pay for that, but it's a limited resource um, and you're competing with others to get that allocation on you know, the DOE systems that I've shown on the right side of the slide. Um, 
the 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 requests typically outstrip the time available by about a factor of three and sometimes more. So the sponsors will wonder if you're being a good steward of the resources they're providing and your concern should be, are you getting the most science out of the allocation that you have, AKA the most scientific productivity that you can get. So the basic message that I would like to take from these thoughts is that good scientific process requires good software practice and good software practices increase scientific productivity. And at the same time, good software practices also increase software sustainability, which in the long term also increases scientific productivity. So it's not exactly a cycle, but basically my argument is that good software uh, results in good science or better science. So what are good software practices? Well, unfortunately, there's no universally agreed set of best practices for scientific software. The specifics are going to depend a lot on um, what your software is doing, who's using it and how it's used and the team that's developing it. But there are a variety of recommendations that we can look at to get some ideas of how to approach this question. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one, is a paper written by Greg Wilson and some colleagues back in 2014 called Best Practices for Scientific Computing. Excuse me, and I'm going to um, sort of scan through some of these. I encourage you to take a look at these slides uh, in more detail or take a look at the paper, actually, for things to think about is kind of a takeaway message. But um, writing programs for computers, uh, for people, not computers, and at the same time, letting the computer do the work, any work that's repetitive, work in terms of small incremental changes, don't repeat yourself, and plan for mistakes, which is essentially about testing in large part. Um, also, um, here's a, a, a classic lesson, optimize software only after it works correctly. This is uh, optimization is the root of all correctness, uh, is the enemy of all correctness. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that the code is actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do before you optimize it, which can screw up what the compiler makes it do um, or the uh, system that you're running on, depending on the hardware. Also, um, in the documentation, so of course, we're all doing, you know, documentation that follows along with the development of the software in a timely manner and things like that. But also, it's important to think about what it is you're documenting. And as um, somebody said, you know, you can read the code to understand that the code says set A equal to B, right? What you want to know is what are A and what are B and why are you setting them equal or why are you incrementing that or, or whatever. So document the interfaces, document the reasons, not the specifics of the implementation. Um, if you have to do a lot of explaining of the code in terms of documentation, think about refactoring it to make it simpler instead. And it's um, useful in many cases to embed the documentation for a piece of software in that software because that's where people will be looking to, to try to understand things in the first case. But it's better to have some documentation um, sort of no matter where it is. And also, um, I, I don't think anybody needs to be urged to collaborate these days, but there are certain kinds of collaboration that can be really useful. Uh, so we even heard yesterday a little bit about the use of code reviews. Uh, so having other people review code that you've written will help you improve your code, will help them understand the code, and will give more people confidence in the code before it goes into the code base. And that's an adjunct to the testing and the you know CI and things like that, that we um, are encouraged to apply. Sort of the extreme version of code reviews is pair programming, where you're actually working on these things together. Um, and then even things like an issue tracking tool is a means of collaboration because it's a means of documenting for everybody involved with the code, which may be your development team and your users and perhaps others what's going on with code, if you found an issue, if you need a feature, if you want to track the progress of, of a development or things like that. 
All right, so these are some ideas. Um, but as they, uh, as a uh, couple of years passed and people commented on Greg's paper, um, he decided that maybe the best practices was too high a bar to set for most people. So they wrote, uh, mostly the same people, wrote another paper called Good Enough Practices. And you can see there's uh, more detail here, but not necessarily the, the conference uh, concepts are not necessarily that different, but um, there's some discussion about how to manage data management, which is new. Um, there's some talk about how to work on manuscripts together in more effective ways. Um, uh, things like, I like 2E, test libraries before relying on them. That's something that a lot of us forget about. We, we are encouraged to rely on other people's libraries rather than implementing our own versions of these things. But then how do we know that the library is doing what we expect it to do? And when that library gets updated, how do we know that the library is still doing what we expected it to do and something hasn't changed under the covers and then now, um, you know, maybe the documentation is lying. So we should not, we trust but verify is the, the strategy for there, for that. Um, let's see. So um, more talk about collaboration. So here's where we have a recommendation to make your license explicit, make the project citable create a shared to-do list for a project, which is something that many projects do within the issues, issue tracker. So you can have, you know, you can use the issue tracker not only for bugs, but also for things you plan to do and then to prioritize those and things like that. Um, they're now talking about um, suggesting ways to organize the project to make it more effective. Keeping track of changes is uh, a lot about version control and, and various aspects of that. Um, so these are a whole bunch of uh, practices that are really helpful. And I think, um, once again, this is a list that people have found you know, useful. It's not definitive. Your project may decide that you know, some of these things are not for you and that other things that aren't listed here might be more important. Um, and that's, you know, that's a really important part of figuring out how your project team wants to work together on the software. And I'll just mention one other um, source of best practices that might be interesting. This is not about scientific software. This is the Linux Foundation who support a lot of the basic infrastructure software that um, is used in the um, Linux environments, you know, that uh, all over the place. This is, you know, things like um, OpenSSL and, you know, various uh, low level libraries and things like that. And they have a structure that they've set up which has three different grade levels. Uh, and most, th there are very few projects right now that are getting silver or gold. Um, most are just focusing on getting passing grades. They end up with a, a series of must and should criteria. And I'm not gonna go into all the details, but this is, this is a great resource in part because they have justifications for every single one of these recommendations. So you can go to the site, which was on the previous page, the, the link is there. And by the way, the, the website that I pointed to before has all the links pulled out onto the, the tutorial web page. If you want quicker access, you don't actually have to go into all the slides to get them. But um, you can see the justifications for all these things. And um, so there are some important things here that we haven't seen before. Um, so th this is of course um, an open source community. So they're, um, they want to require open source licensing, uh, some rules for project oversight and how the project works. In addition to using uh, version control, they want um, uniquely identified version numberings and rules for doing that. How are you gonna uh, identify your versions? They want release notes. Um, they want not only a bug reporting process, but a vulnerability reporting process. This is obviously very important for infrastructure software, but it's also, so these are like security vulnerabilities and things like that, but it's also increasingly important in scientific software. As we heard yesterday, we heard talks about um, uh, systems that effectively expose resources for the public to access in some way. So. Um, these are things that we increasingly have to worry about to, in order to 
expose our science and our tools to the community. Um, let's see, so in terms of quality, there's talk about testing. Um, they encourage coding standards, which is also new from what we've heard before. They want a clearly defined installation system, build and installation are both in there. They should be together, but they don't list them that way. Um, they want somebody knowledgeable about security practices to be part of the project. Um, they talk, they encourage the use of both static and dynamic code analysis tools. Um, these are a lot of things. We, we had a conversation just, just yesterday with somebody who tried a linter on a, a piece of code and came up with thousands and thousands of errors and was immediately turned off because it was just too much to handle, right? But um, it was, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that um, if you can sort of get in there and work through it and then you can, um, once you get a handle on that, if you can keep the errors out, then um, things will be much, much cleaner. So you have something to aspire to. And really part of the message of talking about this last one is that, um, as I said before, software engineering advice often needs adaptation for scientific software. So don't necessarily think that you, because you see it out there as somebody saying this is good software engineering practice, don't, you, don't think that you have to adopt it in your scientific software project just because it says so. There are many things that we can adopt and probably should adopt, but some things need some adaptation and you need to be thoughtful about that and you need to be willing to work through that. So it may take some trial and error. You may try things, uh, try out techniques, try out adaptations of techniques, and you might find that they don't work so well for you and you may have to go back and try again. Um, so don't don't be afraid to experiment with these things, and it can be a little bit frustrating sometimes. But the net uh, desire is to improve your practices, and uh, so this leads to the next question of how much time and effort should we spend on software engineering? And um, as uh, if you're involved in the scientific enterprise, the answer probably isn't that you should spend all your time on making the absolutely best software from an engineering perspective that you can, because you're not gonna get rewarded for that, unfortunately. So you should include just enough software engineering that you can meet your short-term and your longer-term scientific goals effectively. So there's two parts to this. It's key to the science that you wanna do. And also I like to focus on that longer term. It's often fairly easy to figure out the short-term side of things and to figure out where the engineering is going to benefit the short term, right? It's the longer term and your ability to use the software as a tool going forward and keeping it honed that is maybe more challenging to see, but is also the bigger value in the long run in, in this kind of investment. So we've developed a process um, that's really quite simple. So I, I find, I, I grew up as a chemist and I got into uh, software engineering because everybody I looked at was having such problems. And I thought, well, there must be better ways to do this. And so I started reading up about it. And um, so we want to improve our software processes. There's a, a, there's a term for the software process improvement. And like most software engineering things, it really turns out to be pretty simple, or at least this does. This, we call this PSIP, Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning. And what we're trying to do is to instill new processes in your software development that will improve your productivity and lower your costs. So if you look at the graph on the upper right, we have some old process that, that has a certain cost as you go along to make your, your technical progress. And we want a, a new process that will bend that curve over. And we recognize that there might be a cost in the beginning to putting it in place and getting it all working and, and all the rough edges sorted out. But in the long run, the goal is to bend over this curve. And so here's the process that we recommend. First of all, sit down with your team and identify the pain points in your scientific development processes. And there's a tool that we've developed. It's, there, there are other ways to look at this, a tool called Rate Your Project which helps you assess your project in different axes and um, helps you identify 
different ways that you might want to think about improving your software processes. And then you pick something that you want to improve. So just target one thing at a time. You should target processes and behaviors, not just tasks. So you say, well, we need to improve our documentation. So the process improvement is not going and updating all of your documentation. The process improvement is how do you ensure that when the code gets updated, that the documentation also gets updated to go with it, right? So then that's something you can carry forward. It's not just a one-time task. And then you agree on a plan to, um, to work through this problem. You identify markers of progress so you can track your progress along the way. What are sort of key milestones that you can say, this is getting better. And then, you, um, and then finally, how do you decide when you're done? And it doesn't have to be perfection. It just has to be good enough that this is better than it was before. You should write these things down. We have uh, a simple thing called a progress tracking card that um, we have some examples of people who have been through these kind of things before, how they've sort of sorted out their path through these improvements. And then you work your plan, you track your progress on the progress tracking card. And when you're done, you have a little party and then you're ready to pick a new pain point and move on to another round of improvements. So you have a small uh, a process of small continual improvements and you keep bending the curve and, and improving things. And one of the things that this BSSW site that, we've, uh, that we develop, excuse me, is meant to do is help people provide resources to support these kinds of things. And so you can see that um, Rate Your Project is a separate site, but you can see the progress tracking cards. Um, they're, they're, well, actually, so I should point to the PSIP URL is hanging off of bssw.io, and there are other articles on bssw.io. There's some resources elsewhere and things like that. So this is, um, hopefully this is one way to get you started on these things. In today's tutorial, we have a limited amount of time. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of topics that we could talk about to improve scientific software. We're gonna try to focus on a few where we feel that the software engineering advice out in the wild doesn't necessarily address scientific software. So we're gonna try to focus more on those topics. Um, and, and these are the topics we're gonna to have time to hit today. If you look back at some of our other tutorials, uh, especially in some of the longer cases, we have some other content that may interest you as well. So you can look at some of the past agendas and, and see things there or talk to us if you are interested in other uh, concerns. And so with that, that's kind of the, hopefully you're on board that this is a useful thing to think about. Happy to take some more questions at this point if anybody has any. Um, and then we can move on to the next presentation. Yes. If you can use the uh, microphone so that the folks from afar can uh, hear you. So do you think that the languages like Python where uh, the type is automatically deduced? So are they not uh, good for uh, good scientific software practices? Um, so these kind of auto typing languages are, they have potential dangers. You have to be more careful when you're developing using them, um, but with discipline, they can be used effectively and they can be very productive. So there are, there, there are trade-offs there. There are trade-offs in almost any decision we make about how to program things. Um, and so auto-typing languages like Python and things like that lean towards the productivity side of the equation, um, but with due care, yes, you can use those effectively. Hi. Um, so I I don't want to get uh, too far ahead. Maybe you address this in the next section. But um, I noticed on that last slide you showed there was a list of topics that typically aren't there aren't good resources specific to scientific software. Yep. And um, I noticed not on that list is the fact that you have to deal with non-software engineers touching the code. Um, <laughs> and I think I think that's probably problem number one that we run into on a regular basis, especially for uh, people like like you and, and me who are 
started off as scientists and sort of sort of were maybe not dragged kicking and screaming into the software world, but kind of fell down that slope over time. Right. Um, so I'm curious if that's something you're gonna you're gonna be addressing. Um, so I, I will say that's one of the many sociological issues about working on scientific software. There, we're not really going to address that uh, except around the margins, I will say. Um, but it is, I don't want to diminish it, right? You, you pointed out something that's very important. Um, I live in a world, one of the things that attracted me to the DOE labs is the group science, right? And so I've been involved in this since I was a postdoc. And, and I find that, and so I've been working in these groups for a long time, and I guess I have developed strategies that I've probably internalized to, um, to work with these folks. But I do, I've, I've seen it in other contexts where groups get together for the first time, and there are, there's all kinds of challenges with communicating and things like that, and that is, so that's something that we can talk more about maybe at break or things like that. There's, there's lots of experiences but it's uh, we'll only touch on an, on it around the periphery here. There is one up front. Get your steps in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great start to it. Um, this is kind of along similar lines about uh, just you're having non-software engineers, and part of that one of the things that I've struggled with communicating to some of the more just science-focused people that are touching the software is the difference between writing well-understandable, well-documented code and just writing essays of comments internal to source code. Um, and I've, I'm, I've still struggled how to communicate that to people where it's like you don't want them to disengage from the documentation progress uh, process, but you also are essentially telling them, you have to tell them indirectly that their software is too complex if they need to write it, if that yeah. much com comments. And I was just curious if that, trying to balance that, if you have any comments on that, because that's sometimes you get a piece of software like, oh, it's well documented. And then you're like, well, there's actually only eight lines of source code here and 30 lines of comments. <laughs> um, right. And so, yeah, I was just curious. <laughs> Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Uh, again, these sociological issues, it's, it's, they're hard to at least develop training materials for. Yeah. I would say one of the things is uh, perhaps to make that an emphasis of code review processes and try to train people about the differences between you know, uh, good in-code documentation and um, when it might be an indicator that there is maybe a better way to do things if you need that much explanation okay. and, um, or maybe a better way to document things. Hmm. And, um, try to maybe have you know the um, software engineering folks reviewing the code that the scientists are writing and trying to um, just sort of slowly convey this piece by piece yeah. and and you know not just going in and saying ah you always do this <laughs> and, and you yeah. know make it making an attack on the yeah. person but then talking trying to get at um, how to get them to see a better, more useful way to document by, you know, sort of interacting with the code they've written mm. as opposed to the comma and, and the difference with the comments and what you would like to see. Okay, okay, yeah, and I guess the review process would really help. Because often that happens after like three months, they just give you a piece of software. Yeah, well, and another thing is don't let them go off that long without. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point, thanks. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> okay, um, hi, David, it's Maggie here again. Yep. Um, so two things, um, if we can please remind in-person people to go to the mic at the front, um, if you have questions, thank you. And then we do have a question suggestion here um, on the Zoom chat. This is from Janine, I'm gonna read it. A suggestion for your training concerning inclusive language. Scientific software is not equivalent to modeling HPC. Scientific software also include observational software. While the concepts in your talk are broadly applicable, a simple change of language in your presentation will help software developers working in the observation space feel more included. And I comment to that. Yeah, that, no, that's a very good point. And thank you. We, um, I will admit that we mostly come 
we, the developers of this tutorial material, mostly come from an HPC simulation-based background. Um, and that's a lot of what we do in DOE, although there's certainly plenty of experimental and observational stuff going on as well. It's just the space that we've been working in. So yes, we are biased in that way and that it's a very valid uh, criticism of the way we've cast things here. So yeah, it's, it's something that we need to take on board. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks and, for being uh, Yeah. Um, any more questions? So otherwise, I think we're ready to um, proceed. One more here. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned some of the competing interests in terms of incentives for doing performing good software engineering. Um, and yeah, I mean, as a, as a young grad student, I like feel really strongly about being good about my software engineering practices. And like, I definitely feel the benefits for myself whenever I do it, but um, you know, yeah, I certainly feel that external pressure to publish. And so I'm curious to know if uh, any of the folks in this project have spoken about an ideal world where there's a different incentive structure, like what would that look like potentially um, to really motivate like good software engineering practices? Yeah, um, so this Ideas Productivity Project goes back to about 2014 and uh, that was the first case where DOE uh, actively supported a project that was not, they don't support software engineering research. And this it was really a project that was focused on improving software practices and improving software. And associated with that from the beginning has been uh, and uh, trying to raise the visibility of software and the developers of software and the culture around software um, and try to instill cultural change. And there are now a lot more, so we've been doing this 10 years or so, and there are a lot of other organizations in this space. There are some, many who were there before us and there more have joined. And there's a growing conversation that's trying to really change the culture. It's a very slow process, um, especially with research sponsors who are kind of the biggest drivers in some respects. So this is, uh, it's a big important thing for people to think about. It's also a very long-term thing for better or worse. I would encourage you to, to become active in this space and find opportunities to join communities that are relevant to your interests and where you think some of the bigger problems lie and work with them to have the conversations that they're having with you know the, the sponsors and the others who, uh, managers and others who need to help us make these changes in the long term. Great, thank you. I think I'd just make a short comment on that, that there is kind of a research software engineering initiative, I feel like that's started. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, even a conference that is yes. um, happening. And I think I, I've been reclassified at NREL as a research software engineer. So that, that type of stuff has been happening. So, so yep. that helps kind of make a track. Um, so you're not just like focused on publishing. There, there is an initiative because software is so important to us. So there is that stuff going on. Yeah, there's a lot of organizations. There's this um, sort of emerging idea of research software engineers and research software engineering as a, a career track, a recognition of what a lot of people are doing already uh, and trying to make that better recognized. Um, there's an organization called us-rse.org, the US, US Research Software Engineer Society uh, Association, um, which is just a, a, an affinity group or a community of practice um, that's getting more and more organized. They're having a conference, their first in-person conference this October. Uh, so you go to usrsc.org, they have some webinars and things like that. Uh, so that's definitely one place to get engaged, but there are a lot. So look around at what's going on in um, communities that are relevant to you and, you know, find something. USRSC is a great one, but it's just one. All right, we probably need to move on. I don't even know where I am. 